fast, but I, I, I don't drive, and I think that's a, well, I haven't driven since the army 45 years ago, which is a, a good thing if you're fond of um, enjoying yourself. And I was, you know, I was too poor to have a car at first. By the time I was rich enough to have a car, I was rich enough to afford a few glasses of beer. So it was cheaper anyway, and I think more sensible. You don't like travelling on your own much, do you? Well, not really, because I'd, um, especially growing older, um, I, I like to have somebody to fetch and carry and check and uh, do all the hard parts. It's self indulgence really. Didn't you go and see a doctor who had some very bizarre theory about why you didn't like travelling on the underground? Oh, yes, well, that was, that was wonderful. I mean, um, uh, it was all tied up with my mother's never having produced another baby after me. Because he said, um, what, and, and she didn't want to, she was rather afraid of that, because I was a rather difficult birth, being very big already, uh, and, uh, difficult to dispose of, the extricate. Anyway, um, I, he said, what were you really afraid of in that underground station? I said, I said, well, I, well there was no, no train of signal, and I was visited by a quite illogical fear that no train would ever turn up at that station. He said, ah, significant point there. He said, that ties up with your mother. I said, how? He said, well, uh, your fear of a train not arriving in your underground was tied up with her being afraid of a train arriving in her underground. I said, I think, Dr. Worcester, I really must be going. We're just on the verge of a great revelation. I said, well, never mind. And I thought, well, we didn't come to blows, and that was it. But, you know, really, I, uh, as I made a character in a book of mine, say, you know, I, I may be balmy a bit, but not of that balmy. Um, I used to have, I used to have uh, rooms at the top of this staircase, and I can remember it once took me uh, 20 minutes to get out of it after my first sherry party <laughs> around the corner. I went, I went up to my room and uh, I was sitting there in my armchair, the only chair in the room, and two young gentlemen came in and said, we represent the Oxford University Conservative Association. Or, one of them said, looking at the chamber pot in my lap, perhaps we've come at an inconvenient time. <laughs> I've tried to say so. Well, here's the war memorial plaque, with several names I remember, friends of mine. McFetridge, Michael McNaughton Smith, shot down the RAF, he's at my school. And old Manning, tired of a tropical disease in India during the war. You met Larkin at Oxford, is that right? Or... Yes, well, at Oxford uh, I saw quite a lot of Philip, but usually as part of a group. Uh, and often as a part of a group listening to jazz records um, and going out drinking beer. He always bought his round and had a, a, a proper contempt for those who didn't or don't. Um, but he would never, as lots of people, as, as I think really amiable people are apt to say, you know, you make an, uh, beforehand you say, well, let's go halves on this. And then one chap said, ah, come on, I'll, I'll pay. Uh, he would never do that. I've never known a, 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 a man mention the sums of money more. On, on this occasion, when he was talking to Martin, he was being... I could see there was a, the uproar was huge, of course, at the party of Bob Conquests. I could see he was going... and laying down the law to Martin, who was taking all this in, and I hoped, I hoped he was saying something like, the secret of a good poem, my boy, is to have a very strong rhythm or you know, some nonsense of that sort. But actually, he was talking to Martin, as Martin told me afterwards, all about bills, he said. Yeah. I pay the bloody gas bill, and then, as as that, and then comes the bloody electricity bill, and then there's the telephone bill, yeah? um, and too much of like a sister of, of paying bills and incurring expense. Oh my God, look what I've written here. Sir, won't somebody tell Mr. Carter that using long words isn't funny in itself, that the only emotions aroused by the sight of a new Carter letter? Christ. Our savage boredom, felt physically like a pang of earache and crapping contempt that his writing is the product of lop-eared anality, that he has been behaving stupidly and talking piss far too long, that he can do so on his own as much as he likes, that we are tired of being forced to share his little private hell of silliness, 
Won't somebody? Only my dread of the bum-faced donkiness of the reply this will provoke from him has stopped me asking before. Well, I suppose you could say good practice for a book reviewer. What's in those notebooks? What, what are they? Well, this is the uh, JCR, or Junior Common Room book, I suppose, of many years ago, uh, which is a kind of complaints book. Uh, where you, but you can make suggestions about what newspapers the place should take and whether it should be redecorated or not. Um, but it came to be complaints about anything and everything. And it was, it was like a kind of, you know, wall where you wrote rude things, or sometimes less, less rude, sometimes much ruder than that. Dixon waited, planning faces. He looked round the small, cosy room with its fitted carpet, its rows of superseded books, its filing cabinets full of antique examination papers and of dossiers relating to past generations of students, its view from closed windows onto the sunlit wall of the physics laboratory. Behind Welsh's head hung the departmental timetable, drawn up by Welsh himself in five different coloured inks, corresponding to the five teaching members of the department. The sight of this seemed to undam Dixon's mind. For the first time since arriving at the college, he thought he felt real, overmastering, orgiastic boredom and its companion, real hatred. If Welsh didn't speak in the next five seconds, he'd do something which would get himself flung out without possible question. Not the things he'd often dreamed of when sitting next door pretending to work. He no longer wanted, for example, to inscribe on the departmental timetable a short account well tricked out with obscenities of his views on the Professor of History, the Department of History, Medieval History, History, and Margaret, and hang it out of the window for the information of passing students and lecturers. Nor did he, on the whole, now intend to tie Welsh up in his chair and beat him about the head and shoulders with a bottle until he discovered why, without being French himself, he'd given his sons French names. And nor... No, he'd just say, quite quietly and very slowly and distinctly, to give Welsh a good chance of catching his general drift. Look here, you old cockchafer. What makes you think you can run a history department? Even at a place like this, eh? You old cockchafer? I know what you'd be good at, you old cockchafer. A lot of writing novels is self-entertainment. If you're not entertaining yourself, you won't be entertaining anyone else. Um, and that's what only, only children do. They um, invent friends, don't they, to talk to and to play with and so on. And I think uh, making faces is, is obviously or making to some invisible companion. I see what she said there. Yeah. And, and people do it all the time, don't they? And they, people, after all, make faces to God, in a sense, when they lift their eyes to heaven. Um, which people still do in England, even though they've forgotten why they do it. It's sort of up, up and on, oh, God. They're really looking, to, looking up to God and saying, look, do you see this, oh, God? And Jim Dixon makes a lot of faces, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. Because he's, he is very much in, in, in an isolated situation, got no allies at all. Well, most of the time, anyway. And there's, 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 after all, there's some ladies we have to face that you, you need to be a very good face maker when you're if you spend much time with them. <laughs> and, um, what, what's the face he makes? The sex life in ancient Rome face? Is that a face? That's one of his faces, yeah. Is that one that you perhaps have used? What <laughs> that I've actually made? Yeah. Well, you'll you have to let me... <laughs> get rid of it. <laughs> so, so it makes a face ache to hold it, but that, it's, it's based on a mask on the front of a book I saw in the... One of those windows that have the works of Aristotle and my stones uh, on sale. <laughs> In 1948, I married Henry Bardwell, always known as Hilly, by whom I had three children, Philip, Martin and Sally. In 1949, we moved to Swansea, where I became assistant lecturer in English at the University College. I was living in Swansea when my first novel, Like a Jim, was published in 1954. Amos lived, not exactly prosperously, in a terraced house. After Lucky Jim, a path was beaten to the door by editors and film directors. He mixed with all kinds of Swansea people. One friend was a businessman and dance hall proprietor, Sidney Wignall. Kingsley used to come to me with his manuscripts and say, will you have a look over this? It used to take me some time to piece each chapter together, but eventually we got it together and I used to give my elementary opinion to him what I thought of it, 
And in the end, the, the book turned out to be Lucky Jim. As far as me being...